Anyway, I work at a bank, and uh, at my, some of you all have heard this, and you, if you have, just be quiet and don't kill the punchline. Let me do that one. Um, but anyway, I work at a bank, and at my station, I have a picture of my wife and I. It's right next to us. And the other day, I had a gentleman that came in of an Asian descent, and so his English was a little bit broken, and he spoke with an Asian um, accent. So he sat down at my desk to make a phone call about something, and when he was done, he saw the picture of Nicole and I, and he says, oh, is that your wife? Is that your wife? And I said, yeah, yeah, it is. He goes, oh, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. Why she marry you? <laughs> And I, I agree. I agree. I don't know. I don't know. And so I laughed with him a little bit, and he paused for a moment. He said, maybe you say, you tell her you have money. <laughs> that wasn't it. <laughs> that wasn't it at all. And the thing is, you know, Nicole and I got married very young, and when I asked her parents for her hand in marriage, they said, yes, we love you, Mike. We think you're cool. Thank you. And they said, when were you thinking of getting married? And I said, this was April, by the way, that I'm making this, uh, I'm asking for the permission. And I said, this August. And in hindsight, I understand why they almost fell off the chair. But at the time, I'm thinking, what's your deal, man? It's like four months away. You can't put together a wedding in four months? They were gracious with me. But it was four months. I didn't want her to change her mind. That's why we had to do it really fast. She said, yes. Okay, dear, sign right here. You want to lose her. I mean, she's prettier, she's smarter. I tell that story because I really do believe that uh, Nicole, that, that we're not equally matched in a sense. I mean, she is a whole lot better than I am. I do agree. And I think most men here, if you love your wives, would agree with me about your own spouse. I'll give you an opportunity to clap or applaud or something. Your wife is listening. Know that. Um, but anyway, I do want to talk a little bit about an unlikely couple from the Old Testament. I'm not, we don't talk a lot about them. Um, Partly because of the story is kind of a bit of a soap opera in a sense, but it is important that we learn from it. And I'm talking about Hosea and Gomer. Now, just so you guys know, Hosea is a prophet of God. So if you don't know, prophets, these are awesome people. They're a man of God. They're mouthpiece of God. This is, he is it. And that is great. Gomer, we don't know a whole lot about Gomer right now at this point in the story. You'll find out later that I think she suffers from some character flaws. If you don't know it yet, you're going to find out. She does suffer some, from some character flaws. And the Bible says that God told Hosea to take for yourself an adulterous wife. <laughs> oh, goody. Every guy wants that. Every man does. But that's what the Bible said. Now, it's unlikely that she was adulterous at the time because he is a prophet of God, and it's very, it's a bit of a stretch that God would tell a prophet to go marry an adulterous or promiscuous woman. It very well could be a, prophet, a prophetic word that this was about to come. Nonetheless, God said do it, and so Hosea did it. He went and married Gomer and loved Gomer, pledged his life to Gomer, like a good godly man would do. You would think that she'd be moved by that love and compassion, especially from such a man of God and this kind of thing. Maybe she was for the moment. Maybe she wasn't. Who knows? But as time went on, Gomer certainly fulfilled that prophetic word. She became an adulterous wife. She left Hosea for another lover. Think about that for a second. We've got Hosea in the town, as a prophet of God, declaring the truth of God, talking to Israel about their unfaithfulness to God, and in the meantime, his own wife is unfaithful to him. The Bible doesn't tell me what Hosea feels necessarily, but I would imagine, I would feel a little bit of embarrassment, I'd feel a little bit of shame, I'd feel a lot of things, I'd be really upset, I'd be really, really frustrated. But that's what Gomer does. Gomer's adulterous, she's unfaithful, and she leaves Hosea. Leaves Hosea. Her new lover becomes bored with her. Sends her to the auction to be sold as a slave. 
That's usually how those jerks are. You know, if they're, if they're a jerk enough to woo you when you're married, run, run. Because they're probably going to be a jerk after you leave and be with them. Well, he was, and uh, she went to the auction. So folks are starting the bidding, and somebody wins the bid. Somebody's willing to pay the most for the adulterous wife. Guess who? Hosea. Hosea. The man who has been sinned against pays the ransom for Gomer. Oh my goodness. What does that speak about Hosea's love for Gomer? I can't believe it. She sins against him. She leaves him for another man. And she kind of is getting what she deserves, in a sense. We could make that argument. And yet he pays for her, buys her back at the highest price. Not at a discount, folks. At the highest price. Because he loves her. Because he loves her. For a moment, let that sink in. What incredible forgiveness Hosea expresses to Gomer. What incredible love Hosea expresses to Gomer. You can see now why I say Gomer suffers from some character flaws. But the deal is this, and this is why it's in the Bible. Because there's another unlikely marriage that we read about in the Bible. It goes all the way back to creation. So you've got God, who is God. Hosea was a man of God. I'm going to start with God. He is God. He is the Almighty. He's the man. Yeah. He creates the world, all of it, creates all of the world, is the richest person in the universe, creates it all, all of its splendor, all of its beauty, creates man and gives it to man to tend, to care for. And then what does man do? We cheat on him. With his worst enemy, by the way. With his worst enemy. We forsake God and we listen to the devil. We throw it all away. <clears throat> What's amazing to me, though, is how God responds. To our unfaithfulness. Because quite frankly, the devil would have us go to the auction. That's how sin is. We're wooed and tempted and that kind of thing. We think this is where we'll find life. We think all of those things. And then it leaves us empty. It leaves us in bondage. It leaves us there. I'm shocked sometimes at God's response to the horrible thing that we did. So let me read a little bit to you in Hosea. Hold on a second. We're going to go over here. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. This is Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 that I'm reading from. Therefore, I am going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth and as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of Baals from your lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain. 
the new wine and oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those, not my people, you are my people. I will say, and they will say, you are my God. It is on the heels of that rendition that I just read that God tells Hosea, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. <clears throat> I'm shocked that God would offer such an invitation to us when we turned our back on him. Now, let me ask you a question, because the Bible doesn't say this in here, but I do want us to go there in our minds. Imagine Gomer at the auction. Everyone's throwing in their bids, and then she sees Hosea show up, the man that she wronged so much. And she also sees Hosea reach into his pocket to pay the shekels that he was about to pay to buy her back, and she knows what he's doing. That she's about to, that he's about to purchase her at the highest price back and show her incredible love. Imagine yourself there. And now let's imagine if Gomer is unrepentant. Imagine if Gomer says, no, I don't want it. Stay away. Go away. I don't love you. I don't want you. Gosh, sometimes that's hard to swallow. I don't know if Gomer did that. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we've done that. The Bible says that when they were nailing Jesus on the cross, he was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're nailing him on the cross while he's saving them. And they're saying, go away. Go away. We don't love you. We don't want you. Now, I don't know how many of you know, if you've been around for the church for a little while, but um, you may know that my wife had brain surgery a number of years ago. And as a result, she has suffered from, um, it seems to be, permanent or long-term damage that no surgery can correct. And so that's just part of the life now. Well, she called me the other day at work, and I'm sorry, she sent me a text. And she said, honey... I just want to give you a heads up so you're aware, but I have almost passed out more times than I can count. So I'm just letting you know. And she's letting me know in case I need to leave and come home, and therefore I need to make some arrangements at work or whatever the case may be. So I emailed her back, and I said, okay, honey, I love you, and I'm praying for you. Crawl everywhere you go so that you don't fall. I know. That's what every wife wants to hear from her man <laughs> when she's expressing concern. I love you. I love you. She responds, she is so gracious to me, by the way. I did marry up. We know that to be true. She's so gracious, and she responded, Honey, I love you. Thank you for your love and your prayers and your concern. And just so you know, I'm, and she's texting this, and so you lose some emotion and some depth to a text that you don't get when you're in person or over the phone. So she tries to make sure she's offering the commentary that would be necessary. She says, I'm laughing and smiling while I say this. She said, next time I go out with my mom, and you're home alone with the three children, I think you should crawl the whole time. <laughs> and then I want you to tell me how that goes. Point well taken, dear. Point well taken. What's humorous about this is I, I don't mean it, but I will trivialize the challenge that she has. I trivialize it. I'm trying to help her, certainly. I do love my wife. I don't want her to crawl. I just don't want her to fall either. Um, but my point is that I didn't stop and think when I sent the text, gosh, how does that look? When you've got a one-year-old and you're trying to get to the diapers and the wipes and you're crawling, how does that look? I don't know. Just crawl, baby. You can do it. You can do it. I didn't think about that. 
But the thing is, in all seriousness, we trivialize sometimes our own sin. Yeah, we think it's horrible to cheat on your spouse. We'll all agree to that. We don't think that unfaithfulness is cool. Mm -mm. Nope. We think it's wrong to crucify the Son of God. That's wrong. Yep, we can look back at that and say, yeah, that's not okay. But I didn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Never. I wouldn't cheat on Nicole. I wouldn't crucify the Son of God. Sometimes it's difficult to really appreciate the love that God has when we trivialize the sin that we're responsible for and that he certainly paid for. You know, let's look a little bit at what God, how God feels about sin and this kind of thing, or maybe how he defines it in a sense. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Just listen closely. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. Listen closely. Here are the, here are the two that we are to shudder with great horror at. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. I shudder with great horror at unfaithfulness. I shudder with great horror if you kill somebody. I will shudder if you do that. I don't know if I always shudder with great horror when we look for life anywhere other than God. When we're freaking out and we, eat and we, and we look for comfort in the wrong spots, do I shudder with great horror at that? I don't know. You know what I mean? You think about the different things that you do. I need to think about the different things that I do to deal with stress, to deal with things, to deal with whatever. Is that, is God in that? Or am I forsaking God and looking for life, looking for comfort, looking for pain relief, looking for whatever in some other spot? And it doesn't have to be something horrible doesn't have to be something horrible. If I come home and spend too much time playing video games, that's just how I distress. But I'm forsaking my family. I play too much time, spend too much time playing video games, and that's where I find life. I'm supposed to shudder with great horror. We trivialize it. But the sin is there. God's interested so much in our hearts, so much more than he is so much in the behavior. Certainly the behavior is bad when it's sin, yes. But more importantly, it's about where the heart is. Where the heart is. If I'm freaking out with my day because of my day and I'm just looking for relief and I find that relief in something, that's not bad, but it's not what God intended that I'm forsaking him, and I'm going to broken cisterns. I'm looking for life, looking for water that isn't there. I'm looking in the wrong spot, and I'm supposed to shudder with great horror at that. But sometimes we don't. We don't. But I don't bring this up to leave us there, nor does God leave us there. In Romans, it says when sin abounds, grace abounds. And the other thing is, this is an invitation from God. When we feel convicted, it's an invitation. Someone once told me that condemnation drives you from God. When you're feeling driven from him, oh, he can't, he doesn't want to be with me. I'm not worthy. All of those types of things. That's not conviction. That's condemnation from the devil. That's not what God is about. It's about an invitation. He'll convict you, yes, but it's an invitation to come closer to him 
and to be healed. That's what that is. And what, I wanna, what I'm going to do is turn to Hosea chapter 14 because it's important that we know the end of the story. You know, Hosea's marriage with Gomer is a bit of an object lesson to the unfaithfulness that Israel had with him, but then also to the forgiveness that God offers Israel and that Hosea offered to Gomer. So give me a moment. I have lost my bookmarks. Second. 14. Return, O Israel, to the Lord, your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive, uh, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. And then he responds, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. You know, that's what the main point that I wanted to make this evening, that I felt that I needed to make, and that really has kind of hit me, is I think about Jose and Gomer, and I think about how unlikely that marriage was, or maybe how unfit that was with how unfaithful she was, and yet he is a man of God. He is a prophet. That's amazing to me that God would bring the two of them together. And then I contrast that to God and us and the relationship that we have. He is infinitely holy, yet we sin against him. He's infinitely holy, and yet we sin against him. But here's the deal. You know, if you think about it, God told Hosea to marry an adulterous wife. The fact that she cheated on him wasn't necessarily a surprise. God gave him a heads up. And yet he still loved her. We know that because in chapter 3, God says, go show your love again to Gomer. So we know there was love there from Hosea. Think about that for a moment. That's got to be hard. When you know that your spouse is about to cheat on you, and yet you still love them, as you're supposed to. Take a moment and reflect what that means for our relationship with God. He knows it all. He knows it all. He made you and I. He gave you free will. He gave you the ability to say yes and the ability to say no, knowing that we're prone to wander as we sang tonight, knowing that we may cheat. And yet, he still died for you. And yet, he still loves you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So tonight, let's take a few moments. We've got plenty of time because I went through this a whole lot faster than how I practiced it. Um, let's, take, let's take a few moments, but that's fine because you, much, you need to hear from God a whole lot more than you need to hear from me. And so let's take a few moments to respond to that. Respond for a moment to that love that God offers. Absolutely. Ponder that for a moment. Ponder it. And then respond to that conviction. Where do I go for life? Where do I go for comfort? When maybe I should spend an evening in worship. Maybe I should turn the television off. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to watch TV or it's wrong to play video games or it's wrong to eat chocolate chip cookies. But I am saying that if that's where you're going for your life, if that's where you're going for your relief, for your comfort, for anything, 
when you need to be going to God, then you need to shudder with great horror. And so do I. Let's reflect on that for a moment. And then don't let the devil push you away when that is the case. The Bible also says that when you sin, or if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Again, this is not condemnation, but rather an invitation. It's conviction. It's an invitation for us to get wrapped up in Jesus. He says that, I, that he has come to give us life. That he, that's what he's come to give. 